Hello, and welcome to Building High Performance Cultures, a weekly series where we talk to executives from top organizations on how they built high performance cultures and how they're leveraging their culture as competitive advantage. I'm Marty Parker, the president and CEO of Waterstone Human Capital, and my guest today is the co-founder, president, and CEO of Firmex, Joel Lessam. Joel, welcome to Building High Performance Cultures. Thank you, Marty. Great to have you. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Joel. Uh, he's not only responsible as CEO for FirmX's strategy and growth, but he has over 25 years of experience in successfully accelerating revenues of growth businesses. And under his leadership, FirmX is rapidly becoming a standard for sharing large volumes of highly confidential and sensitive documents for corporate transactions, litigation, and compliance. And prior to founding or co-founding FirmX in 2006, Joel drove, uh, drove the U.S. growth of Point Force Inc., leading to the company's acquisition in 2004. And in 1999, he co-founded Crescent Logic, a software company that provided online equity research publishing tools for investment banks. Now, Joel, for people who aren't familiar with FirmX's culture, tell us about uh, the company and the culture you've built there. Sure. Well, um... You know, Firmix is a software company where it's known as a SaaS software company for software as a service. Uh, as you mentioned, we, we provide a facility to share confidential documents for due diligence and compliance purposes. Um, we are, uh, and that's a niche market. It's called virtual data room. Uh, it's a probably $800 million global market and growing. And we're the, uh, the only one out of Canada. We're primarily an exporter. Uh, about 70% of our customers are from outside of Canada. Uh, we have an office both in Toronto and London, England, and so that's the that's the nature of the business, and it's uh, you know been growing very nicely, both uh, you know top and bottom line. So that that's a the, there was a commercial certainly you know I wrote the business plan in 2005, and it was a new category, believe it or not, not probably not that unbelievable given its technology in 2005, and uh, started a business with uh, two other co-founders, and this sort of relates to your question about culture. You know, uh, I I, um, I actually started a company, as we mentioned, Crescent Logic, and I was working 18 hours a day and eight hours a day on weekends, and um, it just wasn't sustainable. And I didn't have a family at that time. I didn't have kids or anything. Um, if I, ha I had a relationship that fell apart as a result. So I, I learned my lesson that, you know, when you, when you build a company, you really got to build it in a sustainable way. And fortunately, you know, I was just starting a family when we started FirmX and my two other co-founders also had young kids. And we, we said, you know what, we're going to build an environment that respects people, not just for the work they do, but for who they are and, you know, people that they need to care about at home. And that really, I think, was, you know, one of the cornerstones of our, of our culture. So I'd like you to build on that a little bit and talk, you know, how you and your co-founders approach the culture, not just at the beginning uh, from a sustainable standpoint, but as you were building the organization. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, you know, the leadership is really critical, the character of the leadership. Um, and the three of us, uh, Rob, Randy, and myself, you know, I, I would say we were, out, you know, self-aware, empathetic people. And that's, you, you, can't, you can't really develop a, or enable a good culture if the leaders aren't self-aware and you know, open to um, you know, uh, recognizing their own faults and so forth and so on. And so with that foundation, fundamentally, you know, what, what, I've, what I've learned and what I believe is that if you hire other people with similar attributes, they will, they will, they will fundamentally drive your culture. It's, 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 or they will let it, they will, it will flourish. And to some extent, it's important for the leadership to almost stay out of their way. And, and, um, you know, I like to say sort of one of our values is humor and humorously when I when I get I do onboarding for for new employees we have 110 employees and I say we, we hire people that are curious driven and um, you know really uh, empathetic and manager's job is not to demoralize them. 
Uh, but you know, there's some truth to that. You know, you've got to have, you've got to let those people have the freedom and uh, autonomy to to uh, contribute. You talked, uh, Joel. You know, on the on the outset of this discussion about your, you know, about about building a sustainable culture around people's lives and family. Yeah. So, you know, I, you, you talk about your own experience, but how did you continue to commit to building and sustaining that kind of great corporate culture over time? Well, I mean, I mean I'll give you an example, a very tangible example of one of the things I don't do and we don't do in the company so much. Uh, we don't email people after hours unless it's a disaster, if there's it's it's an urgent, urgent issue related to something the following day, right? Because you want, because I think about, you know, that could be an employee at one of their kids' soccer games. And I want them to be totally focused on the kid and not on some, you know, email from work because it happens to be, I'm thinking about it, so I might as well send them an email. And just that kind of awareness um, is, is, is really important. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think it just, it just, it, it kind of, you know, if the, if the managers and leaders are like that, then it just, it just becomes part of the culture, right? It, people tend to mimic and mirror each other. And, um, you know, that's how it, it just, it just maintains, sustains itself. That's a great example, Joel. I, on that note, I know that trust and respect and collaboration really are core to your culture. And so, you know, as a leader, how do you instill the, those behaviors into your organization? And how do you model them? In other words, as, as the CEO? Well, it's interesting. You don't, it, you, I know that was the question about instilling. Usually you're hiring people that already have those characteristics. And so um, you really don't have to do any instilling of that if you hire if you get it right on the hire now that being said you don't always get it right when you hire yeah and you will hire somebody who doesn't have those um attributes or you know they thought they did the key is you've got to get rid of them really quickly um and and so we are um you know we have you know it doesn't happen often but we do it and we, we've had very short and we've had people, I think our record is 36 hours. I mean, we've had people uh, very short tenures of permit because we've recognized, oh gosh, we've you know, well behaved in the interview, but not well behaved <laughs> uh, once they started working. And um, when I say well behaved, you know, I mean, they're doing obvious things and they're being rude to people. They're not showing up for meetings. I mean, you were talking about significant um, disrespectful kind of approaches to working with others. And um, and as long as you do that, you you earn even more respect from your current employees. I know you really value transparency at at Firmax and the idea of open conversation, honest communication, and feedback. Uh, and it's really woven through your 2020 Canada's Most Admired Corporate Cultures um, submission, which you have been announced now as a winner. So congratulations! But talk about kind of that approach to. Uh, leadership communication and how you really foster transparency uh, in the organization. Yeah, I well, I kind of look at it more about feedback and um, that there's no, there's nothing, you know, uh, it, that, that we really promote constant improvement and, it, and changing, you know, not necessarily keeping with the status quo. It, People can come forward with ideas and we, we respect those ideas and we implement a lot of them and they see that and they're like, gee, so my voice matters. Um, we're pretty open about obviously what we're, you know, uh, you know, what we're doing. We share what we're doing. Of course, the technology tools now are amazing for doing that. And, um, you know, it, it's, I think that's really important. The other thing is I'm not a particularly scripted CEO, um, you know, when we were in our office, we haven't been almost a year now, but, um, you know, I'd sit at the lunch table and I would converse and same with the other leaders, just as regular people. There's no, the, 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 where there is a hierarchy, it's not that apparent. 
um, I, I, I can be self-deprecating at times. I can be, you know, I had a great advice once from a, a coach who said, um, you, you got to be able to be vulnerable to instill trust. And, and, and you know, um, when I, there are things that I thought might have been a good idea once and realized it wasn't as good an idea. And I'll be very open about it. And, and that puts everyone at ease and they, everyone feels comfortable about being transparent, whether how they feel or what they think about various initiatives across the country. Yeah, well, that's a great, a great example. You know, we, we have a, a leadership training program called Building High Performance Teams and Cultures and vulnerability is what we call building an environment of psychological safety comes through vulnerability. And you can see sometimes leaders going, really? I mean, if I open up about myself, am I not so exposed that people maybe think I'm too familiar or don't have, you know, the admiration for me? And it's really not about that at all. It's about trust. And you build trust through shared experiences and time. And when one is more vulnerable, you, you ameliorate the time component and the shared exp experience. So it, it, it's, a, it's a really great example. And uh, uh, appreciate you sharing it because it's it's certainly a difference maker in in the organizational leadership landscape today. Um, what is, you know when you're assessing, you know, looking for people or assessing those behaviors uh, that that you would determine high performance in the firm X culture. You know, how do you go about that? How do you find those things that are going to make people both successful but also a fit? Well. I'll start with a fit. I mean, I, I have a bit of an unusual interview question. When I start an interview, I say, what are the things in the world that you are most interested in? And really what I'm testing for is curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's one of the attributes. And they're, and, and they're always like, oh, that's, I've never got that question before to start it. Because, you know, they usually go through their education or employment or something. And... Um, what I'm really trying to understand, and of course, then we'll go into, well, tell me more about that. And, and is there is there curiosity? Is there critical thinking? Is there is there drive? Is there passion for topics? And, and I don't really care what topic it is, but is, is, is there? Um, and so, because I'm looking for drive, I'm looking for curiosity, um, I'm looking for critical thinking. And then, of course, you're looking for um, you know, uh, empathy and emotional um, qualities, which I usually lead to, we have multiple people doing interviews and I have other, Sarah or HR is looking for those qualities. I'm looking for the curiosity and drive. And so those are the key sort of fit. I think for anyone to be successful in any role, they've got to have those uh, for, for most roles and certainly in, our, in, in our, our business. Those are really important attributes. The other thing I would say, though, once they're in the working and if they want to be, I mean, success is sort of a loaded word. Is what does success mean? You know, you can be an individual contributor and very successful at what you do. Um, uh, I would say at an executive level, so a lot of people will say, well, success means um, going, uh, being promoted. I, I'm not sure I completely agree with that, but um, I would say, though, that the, what I do notice with people is that uh, some people are very good at executing a plan, so uh, or following a plan and executing a plan, uh, and then sometimes they make the leap because we hire a lot of young people where they start creating the plan, and the plans are have some kind of innovation in them, and they may even be transformative to the organization, and I think those are the the sort of the step change in a lot of staff is that they can go from just following the plan to creating a plan. Joel, how do you uh, how do you identify and support kind of the future leaders? <laughs> they could be the current leaders, but how do you make sure that you're kind of keeping an eye on 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 this person or that, and helping them develop into kind of the leaders that that either they want to be or you think they can be? Well, so one thing I have learned, and we have a a lot of our leadership started in entry level roles. At our company, and yeah. you know, we've been operating for you know close to 14 years or so, and so you know we've been around long enough to develop people, uh, and so you see leaders that 
Spartans, in the, you know, 10 years later of a you know, leadership position where they've got 10 or 15 people rolling up to them. So um, and one thing I've recognized is that um, your existing employees have tremendous institutional knowledge. And if you can, you know, the, the, the ones that show certainly aptitude and drive, if you can develop, you know, teach them new skills, um, they, can, they can be extremely effective. They are extremely effective managers. Uh, there's, um, in my view, a lot less, um, a lot higher probability of success, um, th that approach versus always going out and hiring free agents, um, which, um, you know, 50-50 chance that they're, they're not going to succeed at all as in our experience. So, so we do, we do, um, and we do have in our head, like we notice people, individuals, you know, especially, again, we have a lot of younger people coming on board and you can tell, oh boy, this one, you better make sure there's a path for this one. Because they, they, they just, they will be successful whether it, it, as far as taking on more responsibility, whether it's at your company or somewhere else. And to be honest, sometimes we don't have, we're a smaller company, we're not uh, IBM, we don't have 50,000 roles. Um, although we're a lot, I, I don't want to put down IBM, but I think we're a lot more fun. <laughs> but, um, um, but sometimes it's a small department and you have a great manager already and, and you just have to wish them well and wherever they're going to be successful in the future. Um, and they, and uh, I, I think it's really good too. We, get, we have a lot of former employees who refer new employees. We just didn't have space for them, and but you know we're, they're still, you know, big fans of the company, and and um, you know that's always, I, I'm always really pleased when, when I when I see that just happened this week actually. So uh, we, we on the path of that. Yeah, that's cool. What do you think the you know what do you see as the tools or skills that are vital to the next generational leaders to be successful? Well, come on. Look, I, I think we've talked about a lot of them about, you know, you know, and, and I actually think about this with I have a, I have a 13 year old daughter and you know, she's very emotionally intelligent. She's very mature when it comes to handling conflict and you know, those things I think are just so critical in in uh, any type of um, you know work environment, um, well, almost any type of work environment. Um, and that goes without that's sort of table stakes. Um, I do think that. Um, a lot of emerging managers, middle managers we have don't have a lot of financial um, knowledge. And at an executive level, that's the language of executive. And certainly at a board level at, at, our, at our company, I mean, it, everything's about, you know, revenue and, and, and profitability and EBITDA and various financial ratios. And at a business level, that becomes really, really critical. And so they've got to really move from the tactical to the strategic, but along the way, they've got to be able to couch uh, a lot of the results of their activity in financial language. And, and that's something that I find most of them will have to, have to learn. They don't come out of university with it. Yeah, right. I, I see that too. Um, how is FirmX manages managed through all these challenges and opportunities that have surfaced really for all of us and all organizations over the past year with the with the pandemic you know what are you um what are you most maybe proud of and what have been the biggest obstacles that you've uh, that you've had to kind of find your way through joel you know it was really pretty seamless the the the, the question of course was how is the, the work the work Thing didn't really change at all. We altered, of course, we had a check, each department had check ins once or twice a day, you know, 9 30 and 4, just so people felt connected. And, um, but the real, the other, the real question, of course, with, with our shareholders, and, and you know, it's like, wow, how's this going to affect our business? And that was everybody sort of, you know, we were all kind of here in headlights almost, but we were, we were in really good financial shape and we, um, we, we could be patient and, um, it was it was far less impactful than than we could estimate, and uh, result we, we didn't have to do any um, corrective actions. Um, you know, no no layoffs, no reduction in wages, and business actually is um, doing just fine. In fact, our world, which are you know M and A advisors and deal makers, they've adapted to working 
through video rather than getting on airplanes. And, and um, you know, the business is, is very strong at the moment, even though we're in lockdown. So we were really fortunate. We were one of those industries or, or businesses that, that is pandemic resistant. So I think that makes it a lot easier. Whereas I have um, people I know who are in the restaurant or event business where, you know, it's been a, a totally different story. Yeah, really difficult. And, and through through this time, Joel, what, what have you really learned about the Firmex culture? Well, um, you know, I, you know it, it's always been a very uh, positive culture. Um, that hasn't changed. Uh, I, I do think, though, the lockdown does impact culture. And not in, I, I think it's more fun when you're together. <laughs> Um, people, people, it's interesting. So we did a survey of our staff and we asked them, do you want your primary, because in Toronto, we have an office in Toronto and London. London's different because they look close to the office and it's a younger uh, demographic and they, they, they like coming into their office, they ride in on their bicycles. In Toronto, because people have, you know, started families and they've moved to um, the outskirts and, and housing is extremely expensive in Toronto, um, you know, the commute, Losing the commute was actually a tremendous benefit to the staff, um, to their to their health. Uh, you know, you save you know a few hours a day, especially if you're running juggling kids. And and so we re we recognize that we can trust people to work outside of the office, and and they we can. In fact, I would argue we're probably even more productive, uh, less distractions. What they miss isn't working in the same office. They miss getting together as people. They do. And, and so 95% um, said they like their primary desk at home, 5% in the office. But they really miss the parties and the social events and, and so forth and so on. So that's really a, a, a COVID issue right now. And when that hopefully subsides in the future, um, you know the culture will will get that back yeah yeah agreed and joel we we do work in kind of culture transformation as you know and and curation and right now you're seeing organizations planning just as you probably are for when you're in a scenario like that is that that the office becomes the culture building the culture reinforcement the connection place more so than the workplace and i think the impact is just beginning because you're going to see more and more in you know, uh, in information, knowledge, working organizations like ours, uh, that people do still want to connect. They still do want to see each other, but less and less will need or want to work in the office on a habitual basis. So it just changes what we need to do as leaders in terms of, uh, of that. Uh, and, you know, we can all just, uh, we can all just kind of anticipate what it's going to be like to reconnect, I think right now, but, yeah. uh, but there's more, there's more hope than there is, uh, than there's not. So we're thankful for that. Joel, what, uh, what's the one lesson you've learned in the process of, of building organizations uh, that you still value today? What I've learned is actually the biggest reward for me is, you know, being part of a very positive culture. And I, I don't even look at, you know, sure, I think probably helps you on, on um, recruiting, um, you know, Good people, but for me, it's an end and of itself. Yeah, I, I don't do it because it makes for a better business. Um, I do it because it's important to, to me, uh, and um, and that's been um, really really critical. I, I went through a, an interesting exercise. Um, you know, early on when I started developing the business, I had. You know, we brought in some coaches just just for, you know, it's always good to listen to other people and, and get some advice. And he asked me to write my eulogy. And I was like, boy, <laughs> it's not what I it's not a cheery thing to do. But you know, how do you want to be remembered? And that's an interesting exercise. No one really remembers you for you know how profitable your company is. They remember you for who you are as a person and how you treat other people. And so, you know, that was one of many, you know, things that, that, that occurred to me that, you know, 
you know, it's, it's, this is really cool to build a positive culture. Um, and also, you know, that there's a myth around leadership that leaders are like, I don't know, Napoleon Bonaparte leading the army on the white horse. And look at me, I'm special because I got the white horse. <laughs> no, I'm in, I'm in front. They said, but people actually don't love leaders like that. They love leaders that let other people lead. And, um, and other people be successful. And, and that was also a big, and, and this was something that was imparted to me by, by another coach that I, I had early on over 10 years ago. Those things really resonated with me. And, and I think those are the things that um, you know, important learnings in the, in the development of this uh, organization. You bet. Well, super well said. I've been down that path of someone having me write my eulogy and I've used it as a tool and it is heavy, but boy, does it have an impact really. And particularly on what you really value, <laughs> right? And the things you remember of your loved ones who aren't with us anymore. And you start thinking that way. And it almost puts a, an immediacy to how you want to live, not just how you want to work, okay. um, which is really, I'm, I'm really grateful you shared that example. Okay. Looking ahead, pick a number, three, four or five years, Joel, what, what do you see as critical to aligning your people to the culture at Firmex and sustaining this uh, positive high performance culture that you have? Well, I mean, obviously we've been at it for 14 years. So, you know, I, it, it's been pretty good. And we've had different generations of people, you know, people do, um, you know, move on to, to other things. And, and, and it's, it's interesting, we, we even talk about it, you know, which generation people come from as far as coming in to grow, bringing in new folks. Um, you know, I, I think the big change, though, going forward will be this, in Toronto at least, this different work style. And, and, and as you pointed out, Marty, there's a lot of unknowns. So, for example, I was just looking at a um, new office space today, this last week, and we had our data scientists based on survey crunching the math on how the frequency which people want to come into the office, like how well, much square footage we should get. You know, and again, this is all hypothetical. And so we're, we're out with, I mean, it's almost, you know, a third of the size of our fire office. And, you know, how's this all going to work? And the answer is, this is a lot of unknown. And how's this going to impact our culture? And, and I can't say I, I have a good answer for you on, on that yet. Um, but we're going to, you know, I think as long as people continue having those attributes we talked about, you know, and the, the leadership, um, you know, you know, has you know, good leadership attributes and, Everything will be fine. Yeah, I've been down those roads too. And it's, we weren't running algorithms. It's, it's, it's just tough to come to that view one way or another, but it's certainly going to change. Um, last question for you, Joel, this has been fabulous, but what's the one piece of advice that you would give to a young person starting out on their kind of leadership, high performance culture journey? Well, maybe I'll give you an entrepreneur's perspective. Um, if I may, and as is some good advice I got from another entrepreneur years ago that, that I never forgot, he said, you know, when you start your business, it's your business. But as it develops, it's a, it develops its own identity and it becomes its own organism. And it's not your business anymore. It's an independent business. And it's sort of like, I, I use the sort of metaphor of raising a child. You know, when it's a baby, it's heavily dependent on you, but you've got to allow it to flourish. Um, and, and you've got to give it mastery and autonomy and freedom and, you know, all, and, and all that kind of, all those things for it to be really productive. I think the same goes with an organization and the same goes with people, you know, you can, you can use it in, in, in different um, light. You know, when you're managing people, you've got to take the same approach. You've got to, you know, maybe they first start out, you're giving them a lot of coaching as a brand new job, but you've got to give them the autonomy and the, and the, and the, um, and the mastery in order for them to feel fulfillment for what they do. Uh, and I think sometimes new managers feel they've got to, everything has to be perfect. You know, maybe they micromanage a little bit. Um, you know, actually I had a coaching session with a brand new employee because so I get involved and I said, well, here's the, here's the sales script, you know, for prospecting, but I suggest you write your own. This is just, just take the concepts, but put it in your own words, in your own language, so you own your own, 
And that's really, I think, the, 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 there's not one way to be successful. Your staff can be successful using different approaches. Joel, this has been uh, as real, authentic, and transparent as you can get. And not only has there been uh, examples, whether it be, you know, good news videos, the most interest, you know, what's most interesting to you in the world that I think are, are, are things that people can bring to their world and business. But everything you've shared aligns to this curious, driven, and empathetic, authentic culture that you and your partners and your team members have built at, at Vermex. And, you know, we're so proud to have you as a winner of Canada's most admired cultures. Uh, there's so much that all of us can learn from people like you and your colleagues. And, and frankly, um, you know, you are truly a culturepreneur where culture has been at the center of, of uh, your, your business strategy. And all of us as entrepreneurs have learned to some degree, the hard way. Maybe, maybe some of the more contemporary younger leaders haven't. But uh, you know, by by kind of putting our hands all over our business, and and we continue to make those mistakes. But as we make them fewer and fewer, our businesses do better. And you're just an incredible example of that. So we thank you for sharing those kind of lessons and observations and experiences with us today. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, it's been great. So thank you to our guest today, Joel Lessem, President and CEO at Firmex. And join us for another episode of Building High Performance Cultures uh, next week. And in the meantime, if you want to learn more about the subject matter, go to waterstonehc.com.